Bless God, right now I would like to do a refutation of cessationism. And cessationism to me is false. And it is false to the point that this deems you unsaved. Okay. And I hate every false way. So I hate this falsehood. Okay. When you see people with false fire, strange fire, it is not licensed for you to go too far to the other direction. Okay. Things must be calculated. When you come against the tongues babblers and things like this, you have to do so properly. Okay. Because if you come against them with sensationism, they're not going to be moved by what you're saying because what you're saying makes no sense. One verse in the Bible, unjustly divided, you know, is not going to bring any conviction, okay, on a babbling cult, all right? And as well, when you base things without thinking it out, for example, in this world, how many people are saved? Now, if you're remotely close here, you realize that there's not many people saved. If you are in the truth, you know that there's not many people saved. So how many gifts do you expect to see in the operation of the Spirit? Okay. You need a saved person to operate in a gift. And then the saved person is probably not going to have every gift. Okay. I mean, are all apostles, are all prophets? So you could say I even use the word probably loosely. And so then how many gifts do you expect to see? As I have taught in the past, if you claim to be a Bible teacher and you teach sensationism it's like an oxymoron you know I mean it's like the Bible teaches that teaching is a gift and then you say there's no gifts they've ceased it just doesn't make any sense okay and that's just Romans 12 all right now in 1 Corinthians 12. It's just a simple reading of both of them. So right now, I want to touch on a scripture here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I think I'll do another video and dissect more of the proof text that I aforementioned from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here Paul is teaching the churches that they are to come behind in no gift and exhorting them and as well in this exhortation that they would seek God and even in another place, Paul says, covet earnestly the best gifts. And he'll show them a more excellent way. So whatsoever things are excellent, whatsoever things are from the Holy Spirit, what are the teachings of the apostles? Well, the apostle Paul teaches right here that you come behind in no gift, okay? And in what timing? Till 70 AD? Until the canon of the New Testament? What is he referring to? He's referring to the coming, He's referring to the second coming. 
Okay, so what is the next move here? If you're going to be a sensationist, you must be like a full preterist. Or you have to get some teaching that's not derived from the scriptures on, well, the coming of the Lord is the official canon of the New Testament. And who believes this? Okay. They're unregenerate people because if they were regenerate, they'd have gifts of the Spirit. I'm not saying you got to have every gift. You know, frankly, I don't think anyone in this day and age is going to be an apostle myself. Okay, I know people call themselves apostles. I'm not saying, you know, this way or that way on this, but I myself don't see how the office of an apostle really makes sense in our day since they were sent ones, okay? And you might say, well, the gospel has not got into this country, okay, or this place. And it might be a different discussion. However, to call yourself an apostle right now is a very serious title, okay? To say that I am an apostle, okay, this is a very strong claim where are you sent okay are you some just guy in a local church calling yourself an apostle it doesn't make sense to me if someone would like to try to explain that to me of how that would look I'd be willing to listen but my point anyhow was alright are you going to just work in every last gift Okay, no one's expecting that. But here's the thing. There is no giftless Christian. That's not the teaching of the Bible. Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 12 is that we're one body, many members. Okay, you can't be part of the one body and then not be a member. Okay. And it's not like writing your name in some book at a local cult or something. This is actually the gifts of the Spirit. That Paul is teaching. All right. So to say that you have the Holy Spirit and that you're saved, that by one spirit you're baptized into one body and you don't have any gifts, it's just not an accurate thing to say. So then if you say sensationism, it must be false. It must be something that God abhors. You know? God has to hate every false way because he tells us to do so. All right, so you have gifts until the second coming, okay? And it does not say here that gifts stop at the second coming. I'll touch on that on the other video on 1 Corinthians 13. Because when you really dissect that, there's no wiggle room, okay? For secondhand sensationism or anything like that. I mean, it is all the way gifts in the spirit, in the operation of the spirit, okay, and that will be discussed on the other video, and then regarding this scripture, we see that Paul is not saying anything of gift ceasing when Jesus returns even, he's saying that you just don't come behind until Jesus, okay, so it's a Scripture that they can't deal with. Okay. So they're proved to be false by that. Now, if I go to something here, it might be subtle. You might say, okay, this is subtle, but I think this is another strong teaching here, though. Once it gets balance between the two Gospels here. So in Mark 16, Jesus says, starting at verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, 
In the past, I have said that I believe the 16th verse here is referring to the baptism of the Spirit, and I believe it is in the participle. So, what you are getting from the teaching of the Lord here is being immersed, okay? And I think what the Lord is teaching is not water baptism, of course, but he's teaching the one that is in the present believing. And then the one that is in the present believing is also being immersed, okay? As it is written, my cup runneth over, okay? And in this immersion and being such, you're operating in the spirit, okay? We all know that you're going to sleep, okay? We're humans. Our Lord did these things. We all as well know that there is discipling, okay, that you might make disciples, of course, but you are also being discipled yourself, okay? So it's not like you just walk around and you just cast out devils out everyone out of the whole city all the time. You go to the next city and start doing that. No one's saying this, although in the move of the spirit, you could just start casting devils out of people. Because it's the move of the Spirit. Okay. So you have to have that immersion. And. It's the one in the present that is believing. Because the one that is not believing. Will be damned of course. And. These are the signs. That follow them that believe. Okay. And it's gifts of the Spirit. Okay. Now, in Matthew 28, if you make the connection, and I think this connects back to what Paul said. Okay. Matthew 28. Jesus says this. Go you therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, I believe that is about water baptism. Men can water baptize. Men cannot baptize you with the Spirit. Okay. If anyone says they can baptize you with the Spirit, they're a heretic. Okay. This is what Jesus does, and that's how that works. Okay. But man indeed can water baptize. So that one, I believe, is about water baptism. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even until the end of the world. Okay, so now if you make that connection, what is he teaching? Am I with you until 70 AD? No. Am I with you until the coming of the canon? No. I'm with you until the end of the world. So I take what Paul said, I take what Jesus says here, and in Mark, these signs shall follow the saints until Jesus returns. Okay, that is the doctrine. Okay. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's the authority. Okay, and that's another thing that goes into the book of Acts, which they baptized... Okay, and in the name of Jesus, and then people get the formula wrong, and then they just get all mixed up. Okay, so this is why there's a gift to teaching. So when Jesus sends out the ones he had breathed on, as he breathed on them, and he saith to them, receive you the Holy Ghost, he then exhorts them to go out into the world in the use of the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, they told them also to tarry for a particular gift, tongues, and it was used not as babbling, but to win souls, okay, at Pentecost. Things with God make sense, okay? So when you're not making sense out of the Bible, it's your fault. So sometimes, yes, you have to stop and be calm and to consider and to think things out, to harmonize. But I see clear 
harmonization of what Paul said and what Jesus says here in these places. So praise God. I think this is good. And sensationists need to be rejected. They are not to be part of the fellowship of the saints. Okay? And in the fellowship of the saints, when Paul was teaching, he would teach that there might be prophecy. Okay? And if you're a sensationist, you have to start cutting up Paul's doctrine to quote-unquote culture or at the time of the apostles or something like this. And this is silly and this is folly. And these are the same type of leaven we get from other cults. Okay? You don't like the word cult? It's too hard for you? It's too bad. If you're going to go off and start teaching your own wins and tossing others to and fro and lead away disciples after you, you're a cult. Okay? Now, it'd be wise to give someone the time of day, talk to them, give them a chance. Because you have to be patient. But once you can deem that they are teaching doctrines of men and they're leading a group, well, it is what it is. You know? We all know people don't like confrontation. So when you start throwing around the word cult, it gets people upset. But will you be able to stand the gap? Because, listen, the devils are going to come back at you. And they're going to use the word cult. Okay? But, if you're in the gifts of the Spirit, what will be made manifest in your life? Holiness. Sobriety. Okay? And the gifts of the Spirit. See, when you're operating in the spirit and you have the gifts thereof, the devils will get angry, okay? And you'll do things just like they did in the Bible. And people don't want nothing to do with that. Like you go out to religious services and start rebuking sin, just like they did in the Bible. Just like what was exhorted to Timothy by Paul in the work of an evangelist. People are going to get really upset because the devils know it's the Holy Ghost. And they know to shut down the Holy Spirit, they got to get that person to sin. See, that's what shuts down the Spirit of God, is to get the one that is filled with the Spirit, the one who's operating in the Spirit, to sin. And then once you sin, then the Spirit is not operating in you anymore. Okay? And that's how the devils shut it down. Now, the devils like to attack each other because they're using the people to attack each other because the devils want people to die. Because once you die in sin, then you burn for eternity and the devil and the other demons have succeeded officially on that soul. So they like to attack each other, okay? Because they can rile up enough people to wrath and violence and get people killed and you see it all the time. Against the saint, they got to come spiritually, Okay? Because they know that they don't necessarily want you dead yet. They want you dead in sin, according to the flesh. Sinners might just kill you to shut you up. But if they were really thinking about it, truly demonic, they would say, we first want them to sin, then we'll kill them. And that's sometimes they come with both. Okay, So you can't claim... Not to be smarter and wiser and be a saint. Because you have to be smarter than sinners if you have the Holy Spirit. So, if that sounds heavy, okay, go into your closet. You got to get trained up, okay? Because sinners are fools, okay? Now, there is the sin of foolishness, which is a particular. But to be a sinner against the Holy God is foolish, Okay. For this ignorance, God winked at, you know, but it doesn't mean like they don't know what they're doing when they make idols. And that's the context of Acts 17. What it means is, is that it's foolishness before God. Okay. And if you're a saint, you have the spirit of God. That's good. And you need to know that you have the one that 
can breathe things into existence. Okay? You have Jesus. Okay? He's your teacher. So, when you go off and get lost into winds of doctrine, and you get involved with cults, and you get involved in common sins that we see out in the world today, the spirit is quenched and vexed entirely. And the spirit then becomes your enemy. So praise God, I think that, you know, the heat is on you if you're actually saved. And the devil is going to push at you, and the devil is not going to stop. And to believe a sensationism means the devil already has you. Okay, The devil wants to shut down the move of the Spirit. And you already just shut it down with what you're teaching. You must be of the devil. Praise God.